Welcome to Our Jewish Roots with insightful Bible teaching by Dr. Jeffrey Seif. Today we answer your letters and take a look at our new series, Joshua, More Than a Conqueror. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am David Hart. I'm Kirsten Hart. I am Jeffrey Seif. And do you know that love is a two-way street? That we do love you, in fact, and people respond back. Uh, they write us and send letters, and we get the conversation going. And uh, what we have on the menu today is to do some of those letters. I have not seen one of them. I don't know if these guys are going to throw some <laughs> curveballs at me, but we'll find out. We're going to do that in a minute, but let's talk real quick about the series that we just finished, Faith of Our Fathers. David Barton, an amazing guy. The artifacts that he's brought to, to this series has been incredible. Yes. Where's yes. he from? Oh, well, he's, he's from Texas. I thought so. I don't know where he's from originally, but he has deep roots here. With wall builders, right? That's his ministry. He started that, yes. And really, he's, uh, he's, he's a librarian on steroids. I mean, he's collected all of this primary source data, volumes of stuff to take us back to what they were saying and doing when this country got started. And we've so lost sight of the faith of our fathers. And, uh, uh, and he brought it to light. I gotta be honest, uh, you know, when we watch these programs, this is kind of a little bit more of a laid back program for all of you today. We're gonna answer viewer mail and kind of talk about the series that we were just in and what we're going into. But to be honest, when you guys were on set together and David had these books in front of him, I le legit thought that they were just kind of props. And then he starts saying, this is from 18 or this is from 1700. It's amazing what he had in front of him. They were real books He's, and documents. You weren't there when, when we filmed it, mm -hmm. but, but we had a number of people there with the crew. He shocked everyone. No one expected him to bring out all the heavy cannon. Original. Yeah, and he did, and he really takes this seriously. And uh, his point, you know, I've always been interested in the Jewish roots of the Christian faith. Uh, he's really interested in the Christian roots of America, and uh, we kind of juxtapose those in, 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 in that series. And, uh, you know, he, he brought forth the evidence, like you said. We love how you paralleled and you brought in some of the founding fathers of our faith, and he brought in founding fathers of America. And it's very interesting how many of those lives kind of paralleled each other. Yeah, but I'll tell you, those founding fathers made it easy to do because they speak so much about the Bible. Uh, what you hear in today's culture are the mantras, separation of church and state. No one told them because the documents of our fathers uh, are just dripping with biblical language. If you are just tuning into this program to our program today and you're thinking, what series are you talking about? We just finished an eight segment series, eight full weeks, all about the faith of our founding fathers of America. It is available to you. You can watch it on our website. You can purchase the DVDs. It's a wonderful resource, especially for all of you homeschoolers out there. Um, it'll teach your kids American history and Bible history. Thank you for everything that you put into that. And look, if I can weigh in, you can see it for free on our website. By all means, do it. But if you have a few extra dollars, order the series because what happens is it pays our bills. Uh, we want to give it to you free of charge. If that's what it has to be, it's all good. It really is. But, uh, but we don't get all this free of charge, and we appreciate your help in advance. Okay, uh, you have some beer. What were you just going to say? I do. I was going to say somebody wrote in here about a question that it sounds like something that I would write in about to ask you. So are you ready for this question? You go. Should you forgive someone even if they are not sorry? People have been hurt in this world. There's a lot of hurt. And there are people that are recalcitrant. That is to say, they refuse to bend subsequent to that. So it's a reasonable question. You know, Jesus is on record in the Matean Gospel, the, the Matachahu in Hebrew, uh, the Gospel of Matthew, in the Lord's Prayer, uh, giving voice to forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And then he follows it up by the way, saying if we don't forgive others, then, I mean, so there certainly is a premium on it. It's an interesting word, by the way. There's different words for forgive in Hebrew. You're walking down the street, salicha, excuse me, uh, pardon me. There's another one, limchol, which means to absolve, to pardon, to forgive, and to be sure, uh, biblical virtue beckons us to be on the side of forgiving. With that said, I'd only add to that that we need to give people space to do that at their own time. In, in the immediate aftermath of a shock, of a hurt, of a, of a grievous insult to one's person, uh, they're going to be disinclined to go, oh, well, that's okay, forgive and forget. They might want to rage for a while. 
And uh, I think we need to give people space to do that. Those with the Holy Spirit, with a biblical constitution, are going to recover their equilibrium and learn to let that go and learn to let that person go because uh, the Lord beckons us to be that kind of person. But at its own time, that's what I have to say. There was a time in my life when I had to forgive someone where they didn't ask for that forgiveness, but it was a healing in my life that uh, I was just feeling the pain in my gut. And once I released that, I had freedom. Yeah, we're beckoned to forgive, but we're not told that we have to forget. That is to say, you know, someone could do us wrong um, and to forgive them, to let it go, but that doesn't mean we have to run into their embrace as though it never happened. Uh, now, some can take issue with me on that, but, uh, you know, I, I don't want to be angry at anybody, but there are certain people I don't want to associate with either. <laughs> that same time that I was going through that time in my life, I heard a pastor say, and it, he wasn't speaking to me, but he really was, and he said that if you can't forgive, you can't be forgiven. Do you believe that? Well, he's parroting the Lord's words right here. Yes. That, and again, what I understand the Lord to be saying in effect is he wants us to be on the side of forgiving. And the word forgiving comes from two words, for and give. Uh, you know, that uh, we want to be forgiving, whether it's giving a dollar, uh, whether it's giving a hand, whether it's giving a break, whether it's giving time, whether it's giving someone a chance, a second chance to recalibrate. It's the kind of people we are. And if we're not oriented to be that way, that's, that's problematic. That's evidence of a lack of a, of a Christian constitution to my way of thinking. I do love that for, we are forgiving in many different ways. I, I have to, I was gonna say hearken, that's such a fancy word or old school word. You mentioned Matean and I literally, literally in my emails, this past week, got a letter of someone that watches the program and said, uh, Dr. Seif said, Matean, does he just mean the book of Matthew? What's this Matean? Yeah. So if you could explain that just really quick, because that legit was something that just came in this week. Yeah. I've been a Bible college seminary mm -hmm. professor for over 30 years, and I, and I tell my students I use big words because it creates the impression I know what I'm talking <laughs> about. Part of it's just habit. You know, Matthew is referred to as the Matean Gospel, Luke the Lucan, Mark the Markan, and John the Joannine Gospel. It's just academic language that slips out because, uh, you know, I've spent, you know, 30 years as a college professor. But that really was someone saying, what is that mean? So it's just a formal way of saying, the book of Matthew. Yeah. Look at you. Ready for another question? Fire away. And this is kind of happening a lot right now. We're seeing or hearing a lot of prophecy going on. Um, someone says, how important is prophecy? What importance does prophecy play in a believer's life? Well, I think ultimately, uh, different people, different ways. You know, not everybody's trying to figure out what's happening for the end of the world and how it all comes together. But if prophecy talks about looking over the horizon, um, eschatology speaks of last things. Certainly, uh, the hope of the Christian, of the believer, is an eschatological event. That is to say, their translation into the world to come. It's futuristic. I mean, prophecy beckons us to the future. Uh, it's, it's an impulse. Um, to understand it, to put something together is theological construction. Well, here's what it says in the Word, and here's what's happening in Israel and this today. That's a theological construction. But prophecy is an impulse uh, as distinct from theology. Let me explain. If you look at the words for prophet in the Bible, uh, there's the word for uh, navi, it means to bubble forth. That is, there's an impulse within that needs to come out. Another way is roe, a seer. Someone has a vision. Uh, it, it's not necessarily all this theological writing uh, thick books to explain world events. Uh, some people are more interested in Bible prophecy than others. I think we do well to be interested in it. You know, if we're praying, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done, it's not beyond the pale of reason to search out the scriptures about the coming kingdom, especially as the Bible talks about, as you see the day drawing near, mm -hmm. there certainly is a place for it, but different people are in different places in their own life. Not everyone is oriented toward things to come. A lot of prophecy in politics right now. <laughs> Well, people are looking at, you know, what's going on here, the evil empire emerging and so forth. And yeah, there's, it's hard to, you know, we got to pull away from this series. It's, it's for this segment, you know, it's hard to go into all of that. Right. But yeah, people are looking for prophetic, uh, you know, hints and all of that. Mm -hmm. You're so good. 
I mean, we throw this at you and, and in your brain and God gives you the answer, you're just... Well, you're kind. It's my answer. It's not rehearsed, by the way. I was going to say, it's you're a true. treat to work with. We have more to come in our program. Stay with us. Our resource this week, the series Faith of Our Fathers on DVD. These eight programs reveal how the creation of Israel in the Old Testament inspired a future generation to carve out a modern, yet godly nation in the New World. This series features Bible teaching by Dr. Jeffrey Seif, interviews with Christian historian David Barton, plus dramatic reenactments of colonial times. Contact us for your own copy of Faith of Our Fathers. Join us right now for additional content that is only available on our social media sites, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Visit our website, levitt.com, for the current and past programs, the television schedule, tour information, and our free monthly newsletter, which is full of insightful articles and news commentary. View it online, or we can ship it directly to your mailbox every month. Also on our website is the online store, there, you can order this week's resource, or you can always give us a call at 1-800-WONDERS. Your donations to Our Jewish Roots help us to support these organizations as they bless Israel. Please remember we depend on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you. For many, a trip to the Holy Land is the dream of a lifetime. The Bible truly comes alive as you see the sites where so many biblical events happened. Come on a Zola tour to see Israel in Petra. See the land of the Bible for yourself. Contact us to reserve your dream of a lifetime. I love the testimonies of people who get on our tour bus and say, we didn't think we'd ever have the opportunity to come to Israel, but God opened up the door. There's no way financially we could do it on our own, but God opened up the door for us to go to Israel. If you'd love to join us, you don't feel like you ever can, pray about it. Somebody wants to send you to Israel. All right, we're a television program, obviously. You're probably either watching us on TV or on your computer. We're a television program, but we're also a tour company. This is something we've done for decades, and you're probably watching this program again because it says Our Jewish Roots. You're interested in your Jewish roots of your faith. There's no better way to learn about it than actually to walk the land itself. We go two times a year. Gorgeous hotels, phenomenal bus. You will be safer there than you will be going to your local Walmart. We'd love for you to come with us. Dr. Seifert. You're, <laughs> you're just sitting there smiling. <laughs> no, because I'm thinking of a time <laughs> when I was leading a tour when Zola was alive, and, and uh, some guy got up in the back of the bus and snapped out. He says, I'm tired of all this Jewish stuff. <laughs> and I'm thinking, you know, what a bozo. I mean, he's in Israel and he came with us. What did he expect me to sound like a Franciscan friar giving a lecture through the Vatican? You yeah. know, it's stupid. I know. I, I, maybe I should even say this. No, no, no. But you, this you're is a this little different. We had one person and she goes, when are we going to have spaghetti? We need more spaghetti. And I'm just like, oh. These buffets of phenomenal, fresh, Listen, gorgeous ladies, Israeli food. You might be watching food. the program. The story, the story that <laughs> I, I told know. was 25 I years you, ago. I don't I think know. he's still alive. You know what I mean? <laughs> Eat your spaghetti, love, but let's, right. go, let's move on but, from that. But that's but, why I was smiling. I was remembering that unique moment. But it's moment. a wonderful aspect of this program is, is taking tours. And you and I hop on those buses and we, we pray every morning. And we, we dine together, we <laughs> sing everywhere, we get baptized in the Jordan River. It's but just it's hard to it's beat. It's definitely a Jewish operation. It is. <laughs> <laughs> a little, it's, little confusing. But it's a good operation. We'd love for you to go with yes. us. Yeah. So this, this week's program is kind of a little different than our normal. We're not in a normal series with you. We're looking at viewer questions. A lot of you write into the ministry and we have some more questions for you. You have one, don't you? I do. Yeah. People ask this a lot, I think. They, they know you, but they really don't. So a question is, how could a Jewish boy become a biblical theologian? Well, uh, my mother asked the same question. <laughs> yes. Uh, because I, I wasn't raised into all of this. My wife, too, Barry, 
She has a PhD in biblical studies. She was born and raised Jewish from both parents. And uh, uh, I was born and raised Jewish from both parents. Actually, my mom was a Holocaust survivor. She was smuggled out of the war. Your mom? Yeah, she was smuggled out, her and her sister. My mother died in a mental hospital, however. Um, in the States or? In the States, in, yeah, okay. because, uh, you know, they, she was a little girl. You, you get her out of Germany, but it's kind of weird, you know, and you can get mom out of Germany, but it's another thing to get Germany out of mom, you know. And uh, so I, I grew up in that post-Holocaust Jewish experience, uh, uh, Jewish neighborhoods, Jewish synagogue, pretty involved, went to a religious Jewish school, you know. People send their kids to Christian school because they want to get Christian uh, mm -hmm. education. I went to a religious Jewish school, half a day Hebrew wow. stuff, half a day English, you know, and I wasn't going to be a rabbi, but I, I definitely was uh, more introduced to things Jewish. It wasn't just casual. Um, but in, in, in my case, you know, the 60s, the 70s, hippies, you know, young people, it's not at all uncommon for young people to kind of press to push off against the values of their family of origin to go experience the world themselves. And in the context of doing that, I ran into Christian people. I knew nothing about it. I was challenged. A guy wanted to talk to me about Jesus. He leaned on me and I said, I don't believe in Jesus. I'm Jewish. And we started to get into the Bible. And you were in the Lord. San Francisco at the time, weren't you? Excuse me. No, I, I, on the way to San Francisco, okay. I went out. Um, but it was, and I ran into Christian people, but it was on the way back in Pennsylvania. I'm from Harrisburg. That's where a guy buttonholed me and, and leaned on me, and he got me to pray with him, and the rest is history. How did I not even know that you're from Harrisburg? You know I'm from New Jersey. Did no, you know that? No, I didn't know. Ah, uh, Jersey people. Well, you knew there was something, <laughs> knew there was something about Joy you that I like. I, I'm thinking about friends that we have made in Israel, um, Chaim Mailspin, Dove Schwarz. On our program, they've been They're on our program. program, and they, they're on fire for God as Israelis. It's amazing. Well, I think you have to be. I mean, you're going to pay a price for it because it is so against the norm. You're not going to sit on the fence. I mean, I knew early in the game that, uh, that my decision was going to be confusing for people in my webs of relationship, family of origin. And if you're not serious about it, then uh, you're just not... You know, if you're going to do it, you're going to lean in on it. So, you know, I was pretty zealous, well, and my wife, too. how did that work with your family dynamic? What did your parents feel? They were offended, uh, disturbed. Um, and, you know, when you're young and stupid, uh, there's probably a better way I could have articulated what it was all about. Uh, my, uh, uh, my, my parents were disturbed, and... Uh, uh, they went to their graves with that disconsternation. I'm so uh, sorry about that. It's okay. My, yeah. my, my sisters, however, were at peace, you know, that uh, they don't uh, believe like me, but we're close. There's love. There's, and Jews tend to be very liberal and, and gracious and realize, you know, let people live and breathe, you know, and do their own thing. Um, he, they look at me, he's not hurting anyone. He makes a living on it. You know, you know, he went to college, became a college professor. You know, he's a doctor, but he's not a doctor of a discipline that I necessarily approve of. Right, but look, it's an honest living. The Jewish doctor is lawyer or doctor, yeah, right? I don't write any prescriptions. <laughs> Someone right. said, my sister said, this is my brother, Dr. So-and-so. Someone said, what's he a doctor in? She says, don't ask. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, there, but there's love there because Jewish people tend to be a gracious people. But, uh, but you had a price to pay. Yeah, there was a, the, you, pay you have been paying a price in uh, following the Messiah. Yeah, there's a price to pay from the beginning and today even. You know, there's a lot of people that don't get it. You can talk about here you have this Jewish Christian television program. What's that? People think the terms are mutually exclusive. You're either a Jew or you're a Christian. What do you mean you're Christian Jewish, Messianic Jewish? It seems uh, it's an anomaly and a contradiction people perceive. But Jesus was a Jew. The disciples were Jewish. It all took place in Judea. And we like to look at the good news for the eyes of the Jews. And I'm glad to have an opportunity to come here and do it. Not everybody gets it. I get that, but I don't care. So your journey is really a miracle. I think it's a miracle when anybody accepts the Lord, but when a Jewish person does, it's a miracle on steroids, in my opinion. Another miracle is the fact that years ago, thousands of years ago, a man named Joshua brought the Israelites into a new land and he conquered them. Coming up, for actually right now, you're going to see a little bit of our series, Joshua More Than a Conqueror.
Kanan has proven to be everything promised by Adonai. Just as lush as it was when Moses sent Caleb and me to scout the land. And now the time has come to partition the land to the tribes of our people. Eleazar, the priest, joins me on this hallowed occasion. Just as we've done in Gilgal, we have gathered in Shiloh to cast lots for the land that the Lord has given us. We do so to confirm what Adonai said in ages past to Jacob and then to Moses. It will not be Joshua nor I who will decide. It will be the Lord God of Israel. You've surveyed the land. You know it well. We have gathered in Shiloh to cast lots for Judah, Ephraim, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. They have already received their portions this side of the Jordan. Gad, Reuben, and the half-tribe of Manasseh have acquired their portions over the Jordan to the east, as was pledged by Moses. Benjamin. The land between Judah and Ephraim. Simeon. The land within Judah, with the cities and villages encircling Beersheba. Zebulun. The land as far as Seyrid, then to the north to the valley of Jethel. Issachar. The land from Jezreel reaching to Tabor. Asher. The land from Mount Carmel to the city of Tyre. Naphtali. The land from the Terebinth tree in Zayananim to the Jordan and Kinnereth. And Dan. The land from Zora to Joppa. And to you, Joshua, son of Nun, we give Timnath Sirah in the hill country of Ephraim, just as you requested. It was a dream come true. His mission complete, Joshua would spend the last few years of his life in the green heartland of Israel, within the boundaries given to his tribe, Ephraim. We've come here to Shiloh many times before, as it is such an important biblical site, and this time especially because it's central to the very land allotted to Joshua. It happened that the Lord blessed the land with rain on our visit, so we found shelter within some ancient ruins while outside it poured. Everyone in Israel prays for rain. And I'm good with that, but I say, Lord, why today here in Shiloh, where we have a special TV program? It is special, but you know what? So is rain. If there wasn't rain, we wouldn't have any of these goodies right here. We wouldn't have them today, and they surely wouldn't have had them yesterday. They were all farmers, and they relied on the produce of the earth. In fact, mayim, the word for water, is related to the word shomayim, or heavens. The point is, you look at the rain, uh, this outpouring is blessings. Even in biblical literature, we talk about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, Lord, pour out your blessings, and it's water language. And it, it, it harks to this agrarian language. Well, we're in the thick of it here uh, in Shiloh, a fascinating place today, an important place yesterday in Joshua's day. We're told, in fact, in the 18th chapter 
that when the battles had run their course, uh, Joshua led the Israelites and they knocked out the backbone of the local Canaanite resistance. And now it's time to divide up the tribes. They get their parcels of real estate, their inheritances. We're told in the 18th chapter, kol adat b'nei Yisrael shilo. And that the whole congregation of the children of Israel assembled themselves together at Shiloh. Vayashkinu shom et ohel moed, and they gathered themselves, they assembled themselves at the tent of meeting. And this is where it was. We really enjoy bringing you series every week, but I think the letters program is one of our favorite times that we sit at this desk with you, Dr. Seif. Thank you for just being honest with us today, answering these questions, really insightful just information. Just kind of today. really, you, I mean, you bore your heart. Yes. And that's something that you just don't see a lot on the television airwaves, and we well, just appreciate that. Well, you're kind, that. of course, but I'm more of a I'm professor serious. type, and education is conversational, so it's a little easier. Most people used to administer as a monologue, giving a lecture, but it's more conversational. It's all Thank good. you so much. Uh, new series next week. Join us at your DVR. Get ready to watch on your computer. However you watch our program, we look forward to seeing you again next week. We end this program today with a song from our founder, Zola Levitt, and a word from the scripture. Sha'alu, shalom, Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. For us, your blood was out And now we ask in your home.